Broadcasting from the observation room of the Kobayashi Maru assessment, this is Politrex. The time directive, the declaration of human rights, the United Federation of Planets, the United Nations, the World War II, the Dominion Federation War, the art of war, the teachings of Sirach, Jesus Christ. Welcome, everyone, to Politrex. It's Barry. I've been a scarce voice on the show lately due to a myriad of things that, as you know, have come down the pipe for me. And now, as for our society, uh, it certainly seems like it's managed that uh, in a lot of cases for all of us now. So uh, where's a Vulcan skyhook when you need it, right? So um, before I had to leave on my hiatus over the last uh, two months, we, uh, Shashank and I, we interviewed someone pretty special. In uh, December, Shashank let me know that he was in contact with Amrit Kaur's agent, and upon approval of our questions for her, we would be able to have an actual Star Trek actor on the show. And that seemed almost surreal to me but also gave us an amazing opportunity to engage with not only a new member of the Trek family, but one who brings a vast array of talent, wisdom, insight, and empathy to our fandom. This conversation was considerably longer than the interview you will be hearing, and sadly, I cannot offer an unedited copy as there were some issues with the recording that extended our editing process this time around. So, two months later, here we have an interview. A particularly fantastic interview with a particularly fantastic person. We at Politrex appreciate the time Emmerich gave us her absolute candor and her perspective. I found this interview that admittedly became a conversation pretty quickly, brought me a lot of hope in my recent time of despair. And I hope that in this time of uncertainty, we can help you find a bit of peace and escape while we get to know Emmerich Carr, who played Cadet Sidhu in Short Trek's Ask Not. Welcome everyone to this incredible episode of Polytrex. I have no idea how this happened. I will tell you it started with a tweet. So if you, I highly encourage all of you out there, every Trekkie, if you have something positive to say, just tweet it out and incredible things will happen. But this is going to be, uh, I don't know how long, but uh, definitely one of the most amazing podcast episodes that will be ever be recorded in the history of Airwaves uh, because we get to talk with Amrit Kaur, who played Thira Sidhu on uh, the amazing Star Trek short, Ask Not. There will be spoilers in this episode. So if you have not seen it, please pause the episode now. Make sure you go watch the episode and rewatch it and rewatch it and then come back. But it's nine incredible minutes of Star Trek. Uh, it's amazing that it all takes place in a room, but you don't even think about any of that because Amrit, our interviewee today, carries it so well. But I, we will, we'll get started. We'll talk to her in a bit. But uh, Barry, how are you feeling, my friend? Is this, is this exciting or what? I'm extremely excited. This is wonderful. So um, I'm, I'm thinking we get right down to the brass tacks and jump on in. All right, uh, Amrit, you, you ready to talk to us just all, yes. about everything <laughs> from A to Z in, in Star Trek and your life? Well, uh, oh, just give us a little uh, intro. I'm sorry if we are embarrassing you, but this will just happen. So you, I, I guess yeah, you I'm to just, I'm, to. I've never had someone praise me that much in the matter of 30 seconds. I'm sort of mind blown and blushing on this end and <laughs> I'm fanning myself now. Um, so thank you. that Thank you for all those kind words. I'm an actor. I'm a writer. I um, just shot Star Trek, as you know. Actually, we shot it in May and then shot I continued it in August. I'm a huge activist. I love people and Art is my way of sharing my activism, and I want to continue telling important stories in the world and make a difference that way. 
that was a perfect introduction i don't know if we could have given you any direction on that. <laughs> uh, but we'll start with your connection to trek uh, since that's uh, something that's really important to what we're talking about today what was the first star trek episode movie anything you remember watching absolutely i mean it's interesting cuz you're from india and i'm also you know i'm indian but in my family i didn't grow up with any western cinema and so i i knew about star trek but we weren't really the tv just had uh, indian episodes of growing up we watched mahabharat with with my dad you know which is like an old story of of um it's, it's the mahabharata which is an era in india in hindustan before it was called and uh it just indian soap so when i graduated and I, when i went into university I had the opportunity to catch up. I'm catching up on a lot. I caught up a lot on Star Wars. I don't know if Star Trek fans are are against Star Wars, I don't know, but I just watched the last Star Wars movie. So, the first episode I saw was after I got cast for my research. So, I had not watched it before, but I watched the first episode. I I got a coaching with my mentor and she said start from the beginning because it's the most real in the beginning and then there's so many adaptations. So I started with the beginning. So I've seen some of the questions so I know we're going to get to it later on and I don't want to say it all right now, but I'll, I watched the first episode. What inspired you to become an actress and what works of art, movies, TV shows and books were profound for you in making the decisions you made um as an actor and as an activist too so i decided i wanted to become an actress actually third year in acting school i wasn't sure until third year it took a long time they you know my parents held a grip on me to become a doctor lawyer engineer so it took some time to admit that i actually wanted to become an actor but the movie was fire by deepa mehta i don't know if you know deepa mehta uh she's a canadian director and she's one of the most renowned canadian directors she's indo canadian so fire was about two indians two indian women who were in love and that was very political and very controversial it garnered a lot of riots in india but i just thought wow this woman is so brave to talk about sexuality in the indian culture and every culture in the world has varying sexualities including the indian culture and she was brave enough to talk about it without judgment and without having an opinion and uh that's what i want to do i want to talk i want to talk about brave things that people don't talk about so and and i i was debating whether to become a journalist or or an actor and i found that they were actually very similar it's that type of work that political work that challenges people and reveals human behavior that woke the journalist in me and the artist in me and i want to tell those stories so that was a big one monster with charlize theron similarly it was very political and it revealed yes elin wernes did terrible things but it also revealed the psychology of that it had so many nuances and then the final thing that really pushed me was watching my professors i interned with them in a show called dumb waiters a theater show and i watched my professors in process and seeing them and the intelligence that goes into prep hit the nerd in me and that's that's when i decided i wanted to become an actor after the the summer interning with them So I'm anticipating a seven and a half hour long interview now because there are so many things I just want to talk about what you've just said. There. Like yeah. first of all, um, her, her name is uh, Deepa Mehta. You said Deepa Mehta. Deepa so Mehta. Yeah, D E E P A okay. is the first name. Last name is Mehta. M E H T A. Deepa Mehta. She's not necessarily very popular amongst mm-hmm. Indian people. No, but um, no artist is really. <laughs> Artists but, are always frowned upon. I yeah. know her uh, 2005 uh, Water which was I guess that shows my age she made another movie by called Water I have okay. you, I have you heard of her seen Water Amrit Ah uh, yes Fire Water Earth was the trilogy Mhm and uh, Water was at the time it was rumored to be the Indian selection for the Oscars of that year so Oh wow at least as It the, was as I believe it Water. did get mm-hmm. uh, yeah. an Oscar nomination It did yeah but that's the movie I know her from I want to say you're I think I've never thought about this before that way but you're absolutely 
absolutely right in that acting and journalism are very much similar i think because uh journalism is about finding the truth yes in the real world yes. it depends on the type of actor you want to be a lot of people don't go into acting to be journalists or to tell stories a lot of them go in for fame and money i struggled with that i i got lost in all of it and had to decide and remind myself why i'm in here the reality is i'm here to tell those stories to tell the truth and so the when i go down to it and i answer look at these questions and i answer them it's like yeah those are the movies that made me decide i know not everybody has this privilege but uh, i was i grew up in a large family so i was largely left to my own to go out and grow up and luckily i found movies and i saw a lot of western movies on tv uh, but i always noticed that there were little to no brown people in these shows that you know i learned the language and it's a medium that i grew up in but whenever i'm there it seems like my people are a joke uh, which yeah. is worse than not being there in my opinion yeah. Yeah. but did you, is that something you noticed as a young brown woman growing up in canada absolutely and uh, i've faced racism on set many times without naming movies i was on a movie and my co-star and i were in a conversation with a lady who was very famous and she said uh, oh you're you know you're brown you guys look so good together and um i should get a cow for you so you can get married and uh i should just get a cow and this was a very famous woman and i was shocked and i this was a moment where i was like do i be brave and tell her that she's being you know there's a difference between also ignorance and racism i think she yeah. was ignorant more than racist she went back to dance with somebody else and i tapped her on the shoulder and i said i just need to tell you that what you said was not okay and that took a lot of balls because she was very famous and i was a nobody and you know she justified herself and said her father was a doctor and worked with indian people and she loves indians and um yeah. it's like i'm sorry that i didn't say it but that definitely doesn't change anything you know so there have been multiple multiple i i was on another show where they couldn't apparently find a stunt performer that was brown so they took a white actor and they painted her brown so that she could be my stunt performer so there's tons and tons of situations and then I went up to the casting director and said I'm sorry this is not okay and nobody has the balls to do that and it's always a tricky balance cuz I I don't know when you're at a level where you can actually incite change or where when you're at a level where it might be detriment to you I haven't figured out the balance I am always someone that's that does stand up for people though because it's my personality so I have dealt that's just one of the two of the many but I could name so many but yes it exists a lot that uh like again I mean for for something I have zero context for by going forward and talking to people about these sorts of things um you know you say it, it takes a, a great deal of bravery and and balls as you say to do that and to to go up there and 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 say those things to people but um what do you think is going to be the next big challenge do you think coming forward because i think you know as people will kind of you know sort of deflect a little bit oh hey you know i've got a friend from there or this or that or the other thing what do you think the next thing someone say like myself from a western background and say we have you know maybe put our foot in our mouth or been uh, ignorant rather than necessarily racist but i do think that those things are kind of hand in hand and i'm making word salad now so i'm going to get to the point what would you say is is the best thing for um people who are um in the majority to consider when um they are called on something in that respect what would you say is maybe the best thing for them to to think about or or to or or maybe to sort of see how their reaction you know i think a lot of people do a lot of um self censoring and you kind of even saying like it took you a while to do that you're breaking free of that self censor what do you think the people on the other side need to start um doing when they're told these sorts of things i think people have to accept including myself that we all have a deal of racism and classism and marginalization in us I have it. I have shadeism, I have classism. I have racism, I have homophobia. I, you know, I have all of that. And uh not at 100% obviously, and that's not who I am, 
but these are just things that have been ingrained in my mind. And I have to admit that they've been ingrained. And no, if someone's calling you out, you're not the only one. Every a hundred percent. If someone says they're not, I don't believe it. I I've caught myself saying things about other cultures, or, or you know, I've caught myself thinking I'm more beautiful because I'm a shade lighter, and realizing that that doesn't make sense, or having judgment, or walking further across someone who's homeless asking for money, and thinking what why do I need to make a distance there? You know, I could be, I'm an artist next week. I could be homeless, you know? So recognizing that everyone deals with those things that they're taught and just admitting that I am ignorant and that's okay. I'm just learning. I think what I just said now is probably going (laughs) to cause a ruckus in the comments possibly, but when I say that I am this, I am that, I am that, I don't mean it as a finite thing. I mean it as I've been taught and I have to look at what I've been taught and whether I actually believe those things. One thing I, one thing I would just sort of end with that is, um, is that idea that, that we all have our blind spots. And there's a really great quote by uh, Jose Marti, who is a Cuban revolutionary in the late 1800s. And he said, a child, who, and he uses, he uses the male pronoun in, in Spanish in that sense. So this is a direct translation, but he says, a child who does not think about what happens around him and is content living without wondering whether he lives honesty, it, honestly is like a man who lives from a scoundrel's work and is on the road to being a scoundrel. So I think to maybe reflect on what you had to say there, I mean, is, is that if we're not self-reflecting and self in self-critiquing, then we're kind of jerks. And, and I think that's important. It's not that we're looking for things that are wrong with us. It's that, it's that we always know that we're a work in progress and that we're going to mess up sometimes. And we need to take that constructively. I think maybe is, is, is kind of what I hear from what you were saying. Yeah, ultimately, it's not a big deal if somebody calls you out on something. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that you have work to do, as do I, as does everyone else. That's all. Uh, uh, No, that was great. Uh, I just, it was, it's just, it's incredible getting to listen to someone be that honest. Thanks for sharing that with us. But in there, you very declaratively said, I am an artist. So let's get into some of that and talk about, before you came on to Ask Not and Stole Our Hearts. What was your career like? And if you don't mind, I'll plug your website, amritkaur.workbooklive.com. Please go on there. There are some really good uh, videos and I believe commercials that you were part part of. They're hilarious to me. Uh, I hope you find them. Some of them are pretty funny. Some of them are serious. Uh, but I'll let you talk about it. What was your career like before you came to Star Trek? And uh, just, yeah, just tell us about that. Sure. So there are a couple of things on that website. It needs to be upgraded. I'm I'm terrible at social media. So just with Star Trek, I've I've sort of started. So I need to update everything and decide how I want to. There's just so many people on social media that I think don't portray themselves honestly, and that's why I've not been up to par on it. So it will get better. I'll I'll, I'll make sure it's 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 better. My career started the, f- the first year out of school was very difficult. I was entitled. I was mad that I wasn't getting any work and I was just getting over a breakup and I was very entitled. I felt like I had gone to theater school and that I should, <laughs> I deserve a part. And it wasn't until I met a year in, I, I, I was on the search for a right mentor because I knew something was wrong. And I audited all the acting classes in Toronto, every single teacher that anybody mentioned. And I found Michelle Lonsdale Smith. And though theater school was amazing, often in, in university curriculums or college institutions, teachers aren't allowed to say the hard notes because often students report them or they are sensitive. And the thing with acting is that it's very... Your flaws in life, the things you struggle in in life are the things that I'm going to struggle in in my acting because I'm revealing myself in my acting. Um, And that's what I I got from my coach now, Michelle Lonsdale-Smith. And I did a lot of life work, a lot of life work in uh, becoming an adult, becoming an independent artist and what that meant, being self-sufficient and I trained, I still train every month. I'm, I'm training 
like 20, you can say 20 hours a week in the training ground, taking classes, sometimes 30 in addition to auditions. And that's when my acting career started. So not a particular gig, not anything, but training hard and looking at myself and becoming, working towards mastery in my, in my craft. That's when I became an actor. A year, a year in, I got my first supporting lead. A uh, year in from training with Michelle Lonsdale-Smith, I got my supporting lead in Little Italy. It was a show. And before that, I did a web series, Anarchily, which was very fun. But Little Italy was my first union job. And from there on, um, again, it was a year without no work. And that's the way it is with an actor. It was a year without no work. I did some commercials here and there, smaller gigs, but nothing that would that had a big paycheck. And a year and a half later, I got Star Trek and a couple of other amazing things this year. But this, this year is the first year I've had a full-time income as an actor. And so I know a lot of people who've tried their best to get into the world of acting. And yeah, there's a ramen noodles factor very heavily um, into a lot of their, uh, into a lot of their work. And um, I guess I just want to maybe ask you more, more specifically than, you know, you're saying that there are times when money isn't there. Your art, however, is must kind of maintain that certain level of rigor that you're saying. Um, Yes. Those hardships, um, trying to break into acting and everything like that, what are some some things that, say, a general audience wouldn't think of um, when it comes to the hardships that actors face trying to get their craft moving moving forward uh, with that? I think a lot of people underestimate acting. I think a lot of people don't know how hard it is and the time and work. And I think a lot of that is due to actors themselves disrespecting it a lot and not putting in the training it deserves and the love that it deserves. But to be a master actor, and that's what my goal is, to be a master at what I do. I'm not there yet, but that's my dream. I want to die being like, I worked my life trying to master this thing that I love so much. To do that, like you're training like an athlete, you're training like an athlete. You need to go to the gym. I mean, could you imagine t- asking a surgeon to do surgery on you and they weren't, they hadn't touched somebody or cured somebody in a month? You'd be like, no, I'm very suspicious of you right now. Why is it any different for an actor? So the way I'm trained is that, you know, the audition is just game. But I'm training weekly, like I said, 20, 30 hours. So when it comes to game time, it's not a big deal. It's just a step in the process. So um, if that's the desire to work at that level, training needs to be consistent. And also, you are often going sometimes months, sometimes years without work. So a lot of people have part-time jobs. And so you're training in addition to those part-time jobs. It's not a simple nine to five. It's very rigorous. To be successful artists, there's almost no sleep because there's very little money and you have to do it for the love. That's, I think that's, um, that's what people don't know. Or I think a lot of people think it's about aesthetic. I think people think it's about modeling. Often people think it's about. It's not. A certain type of acting is about modeling. And, you know, amen to that. That's a different style. My style is different. So um, this style of acting where you're trying to aim for the truth is a lot about self-reflection and training when you have no money but making it happen. I think most of acting, uh, I, I was reading a book of an auto, actor's biography, but somebody was saying it's like 95% rejection and just dealing with rejection. And the 5% is something good that happens that you hope that it's like a, it's like a gamble essentially. Right. If yeah. You, I mean, I think 95 is low. <laughs> I think you hit a hundred and you get one, you know, you hit a hundred shots and you get one puck in the net. Um, but uh, really digging that Canadian reference there. Austin Matthews. I love him. <laughs> I won't talk about it because I'm from Edmonton. So uh, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just leave that one out. <clears throat> I want to start make that. a, 
I want to start making cricket references now, but I think we'll lose the audience completely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I unfortunately don't know enough about cricket. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, Amrit, I was so proud of you when you started speaking Hindi. Then I am. Just... Hindi to aati hai. Hindi to aati hai. <laughs> uh, so I, I get that. So yeah, when you're dealing with all this, when, all this, when you're dealing with all this hardship, and th- this is coming from your website, where it said you're a writer, actress. Uh, so I, I was unfortunately not able to find uh, something that I was hoping to read, but that's just because I didn't, I probably just didn't spend enough time. But uh, tell us what it's like being a writer and an actress. And if there is something on the internet that, or somewhere that we could get and read that you've written, we'd be more than happy to tell us about that too. Absolutely. It's been hard to be a writer. And I think everything is everything. The struggles, like I said, I have in acting are the same as in writing. I'm definitely not as seasoned as a writer as I am as an actor. I'm working on a pilot right now. And the difficulty with with writing as is with acting is that I have to share myself and my experiences with judgment. The thing with acting is that I don't I get to escape and I don't have to use my own words. I the writer has done all the work for me and I just have to admit that I've had the same experience. But with writing, I have to write the experience and share it completely in that sense without judgment. And so that's what I've struggled with a lot is is judgment of my own life as opposed to loving it and sharing all of it. So for a long time, I was writing a play, but I was couching the story I actually wanted to tell because I was scared to tell it. And I just recently had a career coaching with with Michelle, again, my mentor, and she called me out on it and uh, told me to be braver and write the story directly that I want to tell. So I'm writing that now. And a lot of the writing I've done as well, I wrote an article about sexual violence. Uh, that's probably on my Twitter. And I wrote, I wrote that when CNN um, came out with a report saying that India was one of the most dangerous countries or was the most dangerous country for women in the world. And I did a lot of interviews with the South Asian Women's Center, a lot of people, and Samra Zafar, who's a woman who's dealt with a lot of abuse. She has a book called The The Good Wife. So I've written a lot of journalistic stuff. And the videos you see, the commercials you see on my site, those are actually I also wrote. Those I directed as well as wrote. And I am in one of them. And I created those at a time when I was just angry. I was angry about what was going on in the silence and the culture. And I wanted to reveal it. And men are bad in the culture, in every culture. And I don't mean to single out just Indian culture. But there's a certain thing with women that hasn't been explored. And it was hard to explore with the Me Too movement is is the silence. And the reason there's the silence, there's so much fear and this, the one about abuse is about, you know, a woman getting a call from her sister that her husband is beating her. And instead of doing something, she pretends she didn't get the call and she shuts it off. And that is reference to something that happened in my family. And when I heard it, I was so mad at that individual that I decided to make art about it. So that's what I write about things that, and I want to get better at things that people aren't talking about the lies revealing them i'm i'm kind of i'm i'm wow um first of all um that's amazing um and secondly just the idea that that you know using using you know there is an, a, a level of anger that is driving you forward in a direction that i i would argue is probably pretty is actually you know going to move into a positive conversation i guess using the 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 fact you know you were you were born in canada was it Yes, I was born yeah. in Canada. Yeah, so just having that, um, <clears throat> I'm just noticing that a lot in, in your life kind of has a bit of a liminality to it, a, 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 a sort of a, the idea that, you know, being an actor means that you produce before you get paid and, and the labor you put in is rarely the, um, the value you get out of it. And, and that, that's something I would, I would say, you know, in our society, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's how it kind of rolls in a lot of cases, but in that there's I a just but just before uh, you continue I just want to say that what acting has given me for my my life my happiness no amount of money could ever give me 
Exactly. Yeah. And, and so I'm not, I could yeah. not repay acting more. Yeah. Fan, yeah. And, and, and that's a fantastic, I'm just saying like the idea that, that like, you know, it gets hard to buy food and, and stuff like that uh, and whatnot. And, but I, I just want to sort of ask you in that sense of within Canadian culture itself, do you still find that the, the proclivity is still to hang the phone up or do you feel that, that, that there's a, that there's a difference or, or do you, do you see that, that this conversation is just as important in Canada as it is in India? Yes. And the, the incidents I'm talking about are, are Canadian. Yeah. And uh, they're just Indo-Canadian. They're still Canadian. And, uh, but if you're talking about Caucasians, is that what you mean? No, I'm literally just talking about Canadian culture in and of itself, because I think in a lot of cases, and, and maybe this is me burying the lead a little bit, I think Canada rests on its laurels a little too often, um, speaking as a fellow Canadian. And I'm really, really excited that you're that you are are diving into these things because I think it this is this is the decade that Canada needs to wake up to a lot of things, and um, and I'm really really hopeful uh, for you and and the projects that you have coming forward. Thank you. Um, I mean, this this type of stuff. It the reason why I get to talk about the Indo Canadian experience is because that's my experience, right? A lot of actors, you know, a lot of actors, and I look at my company, Grace Moon Arts Company, multicultural, almost every single one has dealt with abuse. And a lot of people who have dealt with abuse go into the arts because it's a powerful medium to express oneself uh, cells and, and empower others. In, in terms of, you know, there's, there's it, it's, I mean, it's in every single cu- culture. You look at plays like Neil LeBute, John Patrick Shanley. He's talking about all of this stuff. Margaret Ad- Atwood, Judith Thom- Thompson. She's, she's, you know, lying in the streets is, is all about abuse and alcoholism and drug addiction. These are Canadian writers, American writers, playwrights. So it's in every single culture every single culture and we need to talk about it. I can only talk, I'm talking from my experience, which is Indo-Canadian, but bring my Jewish black friend or bring my Italian friend. They'll have, they have the same stories. Most artists do. Actually, most people do. We just don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. I think it's three out of four is a statistic of abuse or something. I'm not, I I can't quote that uh, because it's, I don't know it, but I think vaguely, it's very high. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I don't know if we as two men can say anything more than that about the topic, but we appreciate you sharing. Really, it. you don't? I I don't believe that men uh, deal with abuse just as much as women do. That is true, uh, but I feel like the topic uh, at this point is about women and abuse. And you're right that men do deal with it, but I, I let Barry speak for himself. But I've known him for a few years. I don't know if there is anything that uh, he has dealt with that even comes close to uh, abuse is abuse, but Mm -hmm. at least on this topic, I don't know if uh, there's much we can add that would have the same power as what you've added, but I do have a question and I'm not saying you have the answer, but you're right in my culture uh, and where I come from, it's a black mark that I have to wear is that India is one of the least safest countries for women in the world. I live in quiet terror every day. I have a younger sister back there. I cannot wait for her to get out of there. My mom, she's stuck in between uh, coming and living in a diaspora and having a life that she can really enjoy uh, and have all the amenities and comforts of a developed country or being in that culture and making change happen there. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to deal with. But what do you think has to happen, especially for our culture, so women can feel empowered to keep that phone going and pick it up and, and talk and resolve that situation in some way? You know, a couple of things. A, this this CNN article that talked about uh, last year that India being the most dangerous country for women, I don't know how biased it is or how true it is. It's based off of a lot. It's based off of, you know, researchers around the world who, I don't know how biased it is, basically is what to say. So it may not be that that's true. It, that does not change the fact that there are issues that need to be dealt with, but they also need to be dealt with just as human beings. Not in, I, I don't want to necessarily emphasize that as being an Indian thing, right? It's, it's a human thing. Um, I think we, yes, we deal with it by talking about it 
and um, educating people. I think we deal with it by admitting it and admitting both sides, admitting our responsibility and our lack of responsibility. I think women are very intelligent and it's a fine line of admitting how much I was responsible and how much the other person was responsible. Same as with men, both sides. And uh, right now we've investigated a lot about men and I think we can investigate more with women, both sides of it. Yeah, I, I would say that I'm I'm the the product of of some very strong women in my life, and and that that includes my partner who who I've been with for for six years now, and uh, I grew up with with some uh, uh, neighbors down the street, three sisters, and I kind of watched their experience versus my own, and 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 you're right, um, the abuse definitely does come, and it, and it comes typically in my experience with toxic masculinity and the the sort of the pressure to be misogynistic uh, in a lot of cases, and and maybe that that's a product of of the region. Um, I'm in as well, but but you're right. It it is it is a, a a larger thing, and and I get a little bit troubled by CNN's articles and the Guardian's articles and such cases that they do come off as a touch Orientalist. I guess is the way of like, ooh, look at how bad things are in this exotic location, and it's and that's where I, maybe I was trying to get to with Canada is that this isn't an Indian problem. This is a human problem, yes, and exactly. and and patriarchy can bash through any border at once, and 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 that's definitely something that I think we all can. Uh, and that, that was a good insight you brought up there. Uh, I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right uh, in that there is bias. I did not read the CNN article, but I can tell you from growing up there uh, for the first 22 years of my life is, uh, I mean, there is bias in all our journalism, I think, especially in India. I mean, one of the most top selling newspapers is called The Hindu. So right. uh, there, is, there is definitely bias everywhere. But there are, it seems like there, is, there are stories of rape and murder of women every other day in the newspaper. And something very bizarre happens in my country where one of these rape cases will garner national attention and people will protest. And then uh, this person will be given, like this person who has passed will be given an accolade and they'll, they'll give her all these, like one of them was called uh, Nirbhaya, which is, yeah. uh, uh, and, and it was just all that the country will come together, almost like very much like the Me Too protests and uh, just all the protests that happened once Trump was elected and then nothing happens. So it, it definitely in my country is uh, uh, irrespective of the articles. I feel like maybe I'm because I'm Indian and because my I, my patriotism comes with the critiques. I think that is something that the country definitely needs to work on. It's hard. I, I mean, it's it's hard because what you'll actually notice um, from the research I've done is that patriarchy and the t and you know female foeticide and these such practices which encourage male birth over female or prioritize men is actually higher in educated communities because they, they've been taught what they've been taught and they have the education to enact what they've been taught, which is very, which, which is very difficult. And even after Nidbaya, there was a case um, after that as well. Just recently it happened. I don't remember the name now. It happened in Hyderabad. Yes, do you remember the? Uh, I think a woman went to uh, to court and she was burned on the way. Was, was that uh, what happened? Uh, I don't know if this is the same one you're referring to, but I know there was a. It was like a 26 year old woman that happened uh, in Hyderabad, and the police just killed all the suspects at the end. Yes, it, it, yes, it was. Uh, I don't remember her name, but it happened. Yes. Uh, she was a vet, uh, and. She was she was raped outside Hyderabad, and uh, I think four or five people did it together. And yes. uh, very quietly, the police just they made up. I don't know if it's true or not, but they said they had gotten them to court, and uh, these people who had done it. And on the way to court, like you were saying, uh, they said they tried to escape, and so they had to shoot them. I don't know how much of that is true, but it's a similar case where everybody in the country got. I together. believe the girl died, though. No yes, the girl yes, died she on the way die. because yep. somebody. Yeah. So what I was saying is that even after the Nidbaya case, you would think with so many people coming out and talking about it, that, uh, you know, female foeticide would decrease and these type of or sexual abuse would decrease, but it actually increased. 
And that I found very interesting. And I'm not sure if it's because more people are admitting it happened, so it actually hasn't increased, but just it's been more reported, or whether it has increased. And I, I'm trying to figure out what the psychology behind that would be. I think that psychology has a lot to do with the the hyper nationalist movements that are that are sparking up around the world, right? We we do see this kind of push towards um, that that sort of um, essentialism. Where do you see those knee jerk reactions helping or not helping? Or was it a knee jerk reaction? Maybe I'm out to lunch here. I don't know the answer, but I mean, it makes me think of you know, it makes me think about Amer- America right now, and we had. We had Obama, and the world thinks we've become so progressive having a black president, and immediately we go to the extreme opposite of that. It makes me wonder whether it's just something happens in the human organism where we think, no, we can't actually believe that. We are better. I am better as a man. I am better as a white man. I am better as a richer person. I am better, you know? I wonder whether we can't deal with our own humility or something. I wonder if, if it's something along those lines, because it does seem like a trend. Now that you're, you know, now that you're aware of Star Trek, now that you're, um, now that you're a part of Star Trek, with all of this artistic passion and professionalism and rigor, what was your experience in, in shooting Ask Not? And what was it like being on that Star Trek set? And, and you know, did anything kind of ping off for you in that sense, given, given your history, your background, and um, your goals? I'm so sorry for interrupting. Before you answer that, mm-hmm. I think the prequel version of that does need to be answered because okay. I am very, very curious to know, and I'm sure all yep. our listeners are, is how did you... How did the call come about for us? Not was it an audition? Just as all, just as the origin story of uh, Thira Siddhu becoming one with Amrit Kaur. And then answer my question after that. But I can <laughs> I can re-ask it later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll do that and then that and then that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I Star Trek has this funny thing where it's the only production in all of Canada that gives weird fake names out as audition titles. So whenever you see a weird fake name, you know it's Star Trek. So I saw a weird fake name and I knew it was Star Trek. <laughs> That's Can you tell us what, what the fake name was? Do you remember? I don't remember. Oh, I man. I mean, don't. I don't remember. No worries. Untitled Project something something weird. It was something bizarre. Um, and uh, I, the day before... Uh, the day before I was doing my acting training and my coach said, she told me that she didn't believe I loved acting enough and that I needed to work harder. And I couldn't sleep that entire night. I got the Star Trek audition and I was like, I'm going to prove I love acting so much. (laughs) (laughs) That's not true. (laughs) I was very emotional. <laughs> Such a smart woman. And then, and then, and then um, I mean, everything, everything in the audition script related to me in the moment somebody was dying on another ship, the, the bowman. And I was like, that's my art. <laughs> Those are my colleagues. I need to stick, stick up for them. And so um, I did my initial tape with um, the second, second coach in the studio, Stephen Park. I did it with him and another actor, Rob. He was fantastic. And we just did it in 45 minutes. And I forgot about it. It wasn't perfect. I got it. I got it. I was in class the last night and it went overboard. And then I just had the audition script overnight and had to shoot it in the morning. So I tried my best, but I didn't have all the lines. So, but the character was so in me. So at a certain point I was just like, man, just give me my laptop. And I just took the laptop and I just looked at the lines and just delivered with, (laughs) with, with confidence because it's not about the lines. It's about the acting. Yeah. And they liked it. It was one of my roughest tapes ever, but the emotionality was there and the character was there. And I think 
my colleague kept on telling me, I think you're going to, this, I have good feelings. I have good feelings. And I'm always like, okay, I did the audition. It's time to let it go. Next one. And uh, I just got a call back, uh, a screen test, they said. And when I got before the coaching for the screen test, I was all like excited and flushy. And my coach said, you're not going to get the part. And I said, why? You said, you're, you're, you're thinking about yourself too much. The cadet doesn't think about herself. You're all about yourself. They're not going to hire that. And I had to be grounded. And she ripped me another asshole. And I had to, and she was like, really? That's, that's as, as much as you got throughout the coaching. And it's like you, you proved to me that you love because my personalization was the Bauman was was my acting company. I, just, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Make me believe you love the people on that ship. And so it was it was quick, but it was tough notes. That's what I love about her. She gives me tough notes, and that's what I need. I went in and I met the director outside, and he kept on saying, "On the day you're going to do this. On the day." So going in, I already knew I got cast, but I, I also had to keep my ego in check. And I kept on thinking of Michelle and thinking, okay, I just have to go tell the story. I can't care about anything else. I did it. And then they just told me, he just told me I got the part in the room. I have a few nerdy questions. Director. That was awesome. Uh, First of all, hold on. I'm, I'm jumping in here. You had, you basically went through Ask Not before you acted it is what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you have to do. You have to you have to go into an audition like you have the job already. But actually I think my audition tape was stronger than the actual what we what we recorded. I think we went in a different direction. But uh yeah, that's my opinion. Huh. Now, when you were given the script for the audition, did it say stuff like Enterprise and Bowman and Pike? It didn't say those names, but it said the bom the bowman yeah it, it it had enough star trek references that i would understand and the shoot itself like time frame wise i mean this is like what a, a like a 10 15 minute episode and it's jam packed with emotion and all of this sort of stuff what's the time frame for a short trek in 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 your experience well, we did, um, I think, two rehearsals beforehand and then makeup tests. And then we did, it, the shooting was two days. We couldn't fit in all the scenes. So there was actually a scene that was cut. Then we reshot some stuff in August again. So there was a third day to just fine tune things and make, make sure everything was synchronized. Watch Tholian Web. Um, where they get the defiant, um, then you'll 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 know why we don't like those Tholians. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, did you like your oh, uniform? Oh, I loved my uniform. They had so many fittings. Oh my god, I've never been fitted that many fit that <laughs> many times before. I think I had three fittings for that costume, so it was built. Compl- everybody did. Everybody just built for you. It's it's, it's crazy. I got paid for getting people to dress me. That was weird and amazing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I need to tell you, it's one of my favorite two people standing and talking scenes ever. Oh, like yeah. Yes. Oh, thank Incredible. you. Talk, can we talk a little bit about the dynamic between you and Anson in this? Like just there, there's, there's some bits of tension that I really want to bring up. There's a point when he is he is convincing you and he's walking forward and talking. And I think most of the audience at that point is aware that we're not seeing Pike. Like we, we all know Pike. We know this, we know that. And we're trying to figure out if he's some kind of mimic, if maybe he is a Tholian himself in some kind of outfit or anything like that. You, however, maintain this level of, I know you, but I don't know you. And I don't know if this is the real you. And now I'm finally like, it's that kind of idea where you've seen this, this, this person in authority, you've seen this person about the ship, you're just a cadet, and now he's interacting directly with you. I sort of saw this idea and maybe it, it was this kind of your intention that you were giving out of like, is this the real Pike now? Is this who I'm dealing with? Like, I saw the man as he walked about the ship, but now I'm, is this his true set self? And is that what got you to raise the phaser on him? Do you think? Or, or was, am I way out to lunch? 
that no, that's not what I had in mind. No, okay. <laughs> great, good for you. Go for it. <laughs> cool. That's, that's definitely an interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Um, my phaser is it's a threat. It's it. I raise it as a threat to stop him. It's the la- It's the last recourse. I've tried a lot throughout the the 10 minutes to not raise it, but he's headed out the door. So that's the last, last grab at making him stay. So that was an exercise in tension. So where do you feel the drive of that tension was coming from between you and Anson? Was it like a game of tension pong or was he driving the tension or were you driving the tension in that scene? I think it was a tension pong. Yeah. I mean, he- he had so many he threw so many things at me that my that my husband possibly is dead that it that i have to listen to him cuz he's captain pike and but i know my principles and i'm i'm i myself as amrit I'm, I, I believe in principle and i've been mentored with principle so all of that stuff raises tension and it's anger and remorse of not understanding what's happening to to pike and at the same time I love this man. He, I've, I worship him. I've never met him, but I've worshipped him. But I have to stand by my principles. There's the, all of that tension going, boiling up until the end. So I'm going to make a connection here. Cadet Situ doesn't hang up the phone. Then is kind of what I'm feeling from that. Is, was is there any connection there that 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 might? have some nourishment to that do you think in terms of like all the stuff you've said at the start of this to the questions i wanted to ask you about the scene has completely revolutionized what you may have had on your mind or maybe the synchronicity to the idea that that here you are trying to tell stories that we can't ignore and he as an actor you know or sorry his character was telling you to ignore all these things and people were telling you oh no you need to you need to ignore the the you in all of this I don't know, this may be kind of off the cuff, but is there is there any connection that you can see in that as well? Yeah, the connection is and I don't I, I don't know if I should answer the question or not question or not, but it's the question I asked Pike at the end. Was the phaser loaded? Yeah. And if it was, if if Pike walked through the door, would she have actually shot it or not? And that's the connection. So I don't know if it's more interesting that I say the answer of my intention or whether that's up to interpretation. But It's always um, better to leave it to interpretation. It's up to interpretation, but that's, that's the thing. Do you keep the, I guess, do you, in terms of the phone reference, do you keep the phone up, listen, and tell someone, or do you hang up? But if you do tell somebody... Will there actually be any change if the person doesn't want to change? So hmm. that's that's a vague answer to your connection and that's, that's answer to the question of whether or not she would have actually shot the, the phaser had uh, he left the door. Can you tell us any, you said you love this man, which we, we got from the Asnard, but we don't know much about her. Like in a weird way, we know nothing about her except for what we have seen. And there isn't, there isn't a whole lot of exposition about her past. Were you given direction when you were, what kind of prep did you do for the role? And were you, were you given, hey, these are things about her you need to know that we'll not share? Yes. I mean, I did a lot. I did a bunch of prep. My uh, prep was mostly about understanding that I'm at a job. You know, I think it's a trap to make it, oh, I'm Star Trek. It's fancy. And I think the short has a bit of a fine line of that, you know, and some people have questioned whether would would Pike have spent that much time with a cadet, all of those things. So it is a fine line. Um, so my my approach to all of that was, and, and which is what I loved about the first, very first episode of Star Trek, is that you know that everybody's there to, to do a job. We hear the, you know, the audio of Captain Kirk, and he's just stating facts of the job. And so I, I had um, Emily Blunt was a big influence. Um, the director wanted me to do a lot of research on Emily Blunt, Emily Blunt. Sicario was a big influence. So the blasting scene initially, it was influenced by Sicario. Um, I watched Edge of Tomorrow. 
you know, lots of cadet stuff was my was my influence. And this was also Star kind of, Galactica in there. No, I didn't watch that. That's one of the most Canadian sci-fi. I think it was shot in Canada, and it's Vancouver. Oh, yeah. yeah, and Rekha Sharma was in it. Yeah. Okay. Friend of the show. Okay. <laughs> um, but but yeah, like I mean, this is kind of your Kobayashi Maru. It's a, it is sort of a no win scenario. Like you either shoot your captain in the back, or you might potentially lose people you love. And uh, those kind of no win scenarios come up quite a bit in Star Trek. And I wonder sometimes if, as an actor, you're sort of prepared for that with a lot of no win scenarios that sometimes you may feel you're kind of up against to some degree. Kenneth Situ had had to make a choice between shooting someone in the back potentially as he's trying to walk out and disobey what her commands were versus the idea that she might potentially lose those she loves, right? Uh, you know, specifically, um, specifically her husband on the Bauman. So it's a, um, it's the Star Trek version of a catch 22. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I was just kind of making a comment on, on that. I want to kind of go into a bit of sort of happier ends of things. Was there anything sort of novel or were there any enjoyments, uh, fun things that happened on set at all or? No, definitely not. It was a horrible experience. No. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. They, they seem like a pretty kidding. stuffy. They seem like a pretty <laughs> stuffy crowd. How was it? It was fantastic. Anson Mount is amazing. Uh, we still keep in touch. He was very grounded. He just made me feel like I belonged there, um, and just like a colleague, even though he has such a big resume, so much more work than me. He was interested in in my approach. He's very serious, and I always teased him on set because he's so serious, and he has this amazing dimple, which is amazing, amazingly beautiful when you see it. And so when we were in, when we were in uh, the dressing room, I would do this. <laughs> what? He's he he's he's a very very beautiful human being. <laughs> oh, he is a beautiful. Uh, <laughs> A beautiful human being. But when we were in the dressing room, I would do that. We would run lines and I'd ask if we could run lines. And um, I mean, makeup room is what I mean by dressing room. Uh, Sorry, I should say that. When I was in the makeup room, we were getting our makeup, hair and makeup done. I would do this thing where I do my lines in weird accents and sounds, which are terrible. And I butcher every accent and make weird noises of being a goblin or a witch or or whatever. And I did a Southern accent and he's Southern and he was like, please don't share that with anyone (laughs) else in your life. And then he also started doing weird accents. And then we do this funny thing where we were both being weird together and it was just amazing. And I just would tease him and tell him that, you know, yay, I made Captain Pike laugh. (laughs) You should do it more often. Uh, Since you brought up Southern, have you seen his show Hell on Wheels? No, I haven't. Oh, you're missing out, Amrit. It, he's yeah, I, awesome in uh, Discovery, but that show is just five seasons of a Southern Anson Mount. Just oh yeah, incredible. I don't doubt it. So, what was it like walking onto the set for the first time? Do you? Uh, I'm sorry for sounding so typical press junkie questioning, but we need we want to know. What did did you know what the set was going to look like before you got in there? What was it like? No, I didn't know. Uh, I had a fight choreography. Yeah, I had a fight choreography and I saw it. It's the biggest set in Canada. So I was, I'm blessed to have had that opportunity and it was gorgeous. There wasn't a lot of imagination I had to do because my imagination was right in front of me. <laughs> Being on other sets and stuff like that, was there anything that, that you would say is uniquely different about the, about the Star Trek set in Toronto? Yes, because there's so many more people and so many more employees, the actors are treated like, royalty and uh there were times where i just it, i just had to tell myself and remind myself to stay grounded things that are unnecessary that the industry sort of does like put it's you know putting shoes on for you tying your shoelaces and I, there was like a this amazing woman but she's like maybe 40 years my senior and she's already on her feet following me and I'm like please I should be tying your shoes you know (laughs) sit down I can uh, I can so this was the culture very um or maybe I don't know maybe people go on to big sets and perpetuate that I I don't know but there there's 
there there is a lot of that and crew is just as important as actors you know and i i did a production little wars and it's amazing it's a it's a production house i'm a part of I'm one of the ensemble members and we rotate half the cast is acting and half the cast is crewing. So I was head of background and I was craft. So I had impulses. There was a time where we had to do a set change and it was taking time. And I, I just took a broom and I was like, Hey, I'll help. But I'm not doing anything in between <laughs> takes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but that stuff is frowned upon, unfortunately. And, um, and I understand that at, at a certain level, but there is definitely an extreme there. And I think we can all find more humility. And I think you feel especially guilty or weird when el- people that are elder than you are doing things because that's part of the Indian culture is there is so much emphasis on Badoki Izzat Karo. That's what yeah. our Hindi speakers out there. But uh... Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Respect your elders. Yeah. And uh, so back, I'm sorry, I'll stop asking questions about the set at one point. Uh, did you like, what was it like holding the phaser? Like it was a, was it a, was it your first time holding like a weapon in a scene or, you know, or anything you were acting mm-hmm. in? Mm-hmm. It was my first time holding a weapon. I have held other weapons since in acting, not in real life, except when I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I, I, I'm supposed to talk too much about yeah. the set, unfortunately. I'm not allowed to, but it was fantastic. Okay, and last question about the set, and if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. There was like a tiny scene with Ethan Peck and Rebecca Romaine, uh, number one in Spock. I was really impressed that Spock was able to say Sidhu. It was clear that he had done his homework. Oh, he didn't yeah. say Sidhu. Uh, that was, yeah, we that did impressed. a little, I remember we walked down the hallway and he was like, okay, so just, how do you say it? It's like, Sidhu, like a duh, duh, not the, not the, the. So we did a little practice. <laughs> I've been trying to learn bits of Hindi and uh, yeah, Hindi, Hindi, not yes. Hindi, Hindi. And yeah, that's, that's tough for the, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, laryngeal exercise in there. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, there's just different um, ways of holding your tongue. Yeah. Which that's the key to exist. accent. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. mother tongue is actually Punjabi, but uh, yeah. Hindi I've, I've, I've picked up from Indian cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Years of telemarketing. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, just sort of as things have kind of moved forward, obviously there is a social media and there is a Star Trek community that is varied to say the best. Um, how has, how has the reaction been so far? How have you, um, you know, now that, now that you are, you're a member of the community now and welcome, we're, we're so excited to have you uh, a part of it. And we hope, we hope you get a chance to, to, to check out some of the conventions. They, they are loads of fun. And I can, I can say that just in the sense of being a convention attendee. Um, I've literally asked some of the actors, are you having fun? And they're like, I look forward to this every year. It's super fun. And <laughs> I imagine. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, but outside of that, how has the response been and, and, you know, positives, negatives, in-betweens, how, how has it been? It's been incredibly positive. I, I, I was not expecting it at all. Um, when, unfortunately when it aired, the first time it aired, I was in Miami and my, I had, my phone had been robbed. So I didn't actually see the response till I got to Canada and I was blown away. I was blown away. I mean, I mean, I'm a newbie with social media. I think I had like 60 followers and then I woke up and it was like, oh my God, people like me, which was, it was pretty drastic. And yeah, so it was, the response has been amazing. There have been some touching, very touching messages. One person said that they showed their eight-year-old daughter Star Trek and they wanted to give her a role model of a strong woman. And that was, that was, I shared that with my mentor and I'm like, that's what I do it for, you know? that's what you do it for that. Someone's like, God, I want to do that. I want to do that. That was just amazing. So that was probably one of the greatest things ever anyone said to me. Um, But there have been other in terms of not so great things. It have been more about my appearance, which has been interesting. I think there was 
in the in a in another p- podcast, I brought it up as well. There, someone had a comment about the size of my nose, which was which was funny. I actually laughed at it because I have insecurities for my uh, about my nose, and I always have. Um, I think the world is just not used to Indian nose noses, and it, it, that'll change shortly. When God was making people, he put the leftover clay on our noses. That's what happened. Absolutely. <laughs> and it, yeah, you have to laugh at it, man. And I just took the message and I screenshotted it and sent it to everybody that knows that I have an insecurity. And it was funny. And But it's a, it's a thing. And people, I, I don't know. Again, I think that's just ignorance. People, I do have a big nose. But you know what? Fuck it. I <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. um and uh yeah when I when I got into the industry the first agent I ever met told me that if I wanted to become a lead I needed to change my nose and that made me very scared the first year out of theater school I got very vain and I still have to work on that the vanity often comes up trying to change who I am as opposed to being like I was created this way and stories need to be told about my face, not always the brown girl that looks like a model, you know, because that's not most of us. So I I did a lot of work. I've done a lot of work on on my self-loathing. And so I was able to look at that and laugh at it. But it, it just means that more people that look like me need to be up there. So it's not a thing. And you did the right thing, Missy Elliott. You flipped it and reversed it. <laughs> I think I replied back to him and I was like, yeah, it is huge. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> funny. Is there anything you can tell us about Tira Sidhu? Do you, Amrit Kaur, think we'll see her again? I don't know anything. I and know that's going to be your answer. Yeah. yeah, I know as much as you. That's my honest answer. Okay. I have a crackpot theory that you guys are quietly filming and you'll just drop it uh, <laughs> one of these days and they'll say, hey, just say, no, the Pike show is on and Amrit Kaur is on it. Just go watch it. So mm-hmm. I, that's, that's my crackpot theory, uh, my right. crazy tinfoil hat uh, theory. Mm-hmm. But uh, what have you got going on? Is there anything that we can follow you into and see and watch and hear you on? Yeah. I mean, I have... Um... A bunch of stuff going on. I'm, I'm, uh, it's interesting because I'm not sure what I'm allowed to talk to about or not. But I'm uh, the series I told you about with Grace Moon Arts Company. It's coming out. It's called Little Wars, mm-hmm. and I'm very excited about that. I've been working on it with my company for a year and a half. We're halfway through filming. And that's really, it looks at so many different issues. It looks at Islamophobia, it looks like at misogyny, it looks at this influencer fandom craziness, it looks at pornography, it looks at so many things that people are scared to talk about. And basically, eight different lives come together at an event where anger from their own lives leads to an Islamophobic brawl and an innocent boy is, is, dies as a result of it. And uh, we look at the before and aftermath leading up to that incident. And so that's the thing I'm most excited about. Uh, I also just shot a series called Queer Haircuts, and I was one of the leads in that. So that's a love story between two women. That was amazing. I've, uh, I've not seen a brown woman being openly gay without it being a thing. So that's what that aim. I was very excited about that. It's not a thing. It's just, I was just cast. It, it was no intention of it being an Indian person. Actually, also Star Trek, there was no intention of it being an Indian person. They changed the name for me. Um, oh, wow. There don't, was no I don't think anybody knows that. That might be a first. I, we, we def- I personally thought it was definitely to have an Indian character play that yeah. role. They, they, the character was unnamed or I don't remember what the maybe there was it was an open ethnicity call so they they auditioned everybody and they just liked my tape which I love I love that which was the same with queer haircuts they weren't looking for a brown woman they just liked my tape so that's that and I'm on set tomorrow for filming something else Uh, that's fantastic that movie is called stealing vows and that should come up Sometime this year as well. 
So a couple of things to look right out on. for. Do you want to tell us where we can follow you on Twitter? I know you're not a social media person, but I know you very politely take time and thank everybody who sends you good messages. The least I could do. Yes, I want to be better at it. So if if you, everyone can help me get better at it, that would be fantastic. So let me just um, find what my handles are because (laughs) when I don't know them off by heart. Your Twitter is amritkaur underscore zero four. A-M-R-I-T-K-A-U-R underscore zero four. I've I've just spent so much time there. I know. Uh, yeah, that's that's what we can put down. And then for Instagram, it's uh, actually it is Amrit underscore car zero four is the Instagram. So I had another question. And this is Great. just me. Um, so Shashank has taught me a lot about uh, about Indian history. And I've taken a lot more time to start to learning about Canadian Indian history, which is very rich, um, especially actually the city I'm from Edmonton has um, an amazingly strong uh, Indian heritage. And actually, I I lived in London, UK for a little while and learned a little bit about Sri Lankan community because I lived in that area as well. Also very cool. But one thing I did find out that there was a Indian politician from um, sort of the, the, the transitional period when the Indian National Congress was was um, was kind of coming into 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 its its own in 1947, and until about 1957, um, she went by um, and I'm sorry, Rajkumari uh, BBG Amrit Kaur. Um, she was an activist and a politician. I'm just wondering if if you might have been named after her, or if you're familiar with her, or, or anything like that. Uh, that's funny. Um, I've I've read about her when I've uh, looked up my own name. Yeah, and she, without a doubt, deserves to be more popular than me. <laughs> <laughs> Very she's fascinating done, story. She's done a great amount of work. Um, I was not named after her. I was, but I was named after a journalist whose name was actually Amrita. But my parents thought Amrita was a knockoff of Amrit, so they just went with Amrit. Yep, yeah, fair enough. Well, that's Amrit. also really fascinating. Yeah, Amrit is the elixir of immortality. Uh, at at yeah. least I think that that's that's what holy nectar. Yeah, it's. I definitely have not lived up to the title. <laughs> uh, hey, we got time. does it for our show it was absolutely wonderful getting again to uh, speak with amrit and we really hope that you all enjoyed this episode of course uh, polytrex is a proud member of the trek geeks network and you can check out our podcast among all of the other ones uh, on uh, basically any podcasting uh, app you like apple spotify there's a whole bunch of other ones but i don't have it listed right now so definitely uh We were happy to have this episode. Hope you enjoy it and uh, live long and prosper and onward to Star Society. Polytrex is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For even more Star Trek discussion, check out the other members of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and TrekGeeks.com.